<laughs> Hello, my friends. So this is the second part to my video response to William Ramsey and the Alistair Crowley connection to September 11, 2001. I'm still not quite too sure how William Ramsey's is tying together Alistair Crowley and September 11th, 2001. But somehow he makes some sort of a case for it based upon numbers and the fact that musicians liked Alistair Crowley. Let's listen to uh, Tom and Jerry talk about... Excuse me, I'm sorry. Tom and Jared talked to William Ramsey about why he believes that Aleister Crowley was behind the attacks of September 11th. A link to the first video is below. Here is the second part. I hope you enjoy. Thank you so much. People like uh, Daryl Hall from the group Hall & Oates right. are known to just look at... Uh, uh, Crowley has an influence and we see it all over and we saw it in, in a lot of the metal groups Okay, then but okay yeah, in the 2000s. It, yeah. it was all the pop groups. Yeah, so what are we looking at now? What what kind now of influence do well, you now? See? It's the rap groups, too. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, it's rap. Yes Alistair Crowley has had influence on popular culture art and music. That certainly is true It doesn't mean that his influence overpowers people or somehow strips them of their own agency and free will I heard that Elvis loved the occult, you know, and he was reading Blavatsky. Oh, you heard it Well, then it must be true. I don't even know what else he wrote, but a lot of these guys, and it seeds out. I mean, there's a picture in my book, Children of the Beast of Sting, holding a book by Crowley. I heard that Steven Tyler loves Crowley from Aerosmith. I heard that Elvis Presley, Sting, Steven Tyler, and others read the Bible. Obviously, there is a direct connection and causational influence between them reading the Bible and um, making music. Didn't I mention I heard this from somebody somewhere or read it someplace? You know, all these guys. So, uh... Tool, this band Tool, their drummer collects all their their books. Um, so I think that he, you know, he talked about the birth of the child, the birth of Horus, the age of Horus, you know, and he, he actually said, you know, by the end of the century, the world will be sitting in the sunset of Crowleyanity. In a certain effect, certain sense, I think that he was... Right. Crowley was a very prolific writer. He thought a great deal of himself and wrote many archaic and philosophical ideas. You could pick any number of his sayings, quotes, poems, or rituals and take them out of context and use them to support any number of points. It does not mean there is any direct or even real relation. Crowley wrote rather tongue-in-cheek. He was a bit of a troll of the early 1900s. He enjoyed shocking people and he enjoyed scaring the gullible. In, in, in his writings he would talk about uh, just uh, bringing confusion. No, if anything he wanted to elucidate make things clearer. And learning how to talk backwards. Yes, this was a recommendation for the exempt adept grade. First method, let the exempt adept first train himself to think backwards by external means as set forth here following. Let him learn to write backwards with either hand. Let him learn to walk backwards. Let him constantly watch, if convenient, cinematograph films and listen to the phonograph records reverse. And let him so accustom himself to those that they appear natural and appreciable as a whole. Let him practice speaking backwards. Thus, for I am he, let him say, eh, ma, I. Let him learn to read backwards. In this, it is difficult to avoid cheating oneself, as an expert reader sees a sentence at a glance. Let his disciple read aloud to him backwards, slowly at first, then more quickly. Of his own ingenium, let him devise other methods. Number 12. In this, his brain will at first be overwhelmed by a sense of utter confusion. Secondly, it will endeavor to evade the difficulty by a trick. The brain will pretend to be working backwards when it is really normal. It is difficult to describe the nature of this trick, but it will be quite obvious to anyone who has done practices of A and B for a day or two. They become quite easy and he will think that he is making progress, an illusion which close analysis will dispel. Yes. And learning how, you know, learning how to do deception, of course. 
Learning how to deception is not that difficult, as demonstrated by Mr. Willie here. Just commit logical fallacies, make connections where there are none. If needed, just make stuff up and never ever back up your claims with researchable evidence. Keep it incredibly vague to maintain the cloak of deception, and for good measure, throw in some elements of truth. But be sure to twist that truth to make it appear as an admission of guilt. Or an aha, see, I told you so moment. That's remarkable. I mean, the, the, when the, there's a distinct difference between love one another and love under law, love under will. Yes, and there is a difference between love and agape. Agape is a divine, universal, unconditional love. This saying, love is a law, love under will, is what agape refers to. A love of all. A love under will. It is love under one's true divine self. One's true nature and self. You could break it down to love and will in the colloquial sense, but if you do, you are missing a deeper meaning. So love under will is under yourself, you know, it's basically you love uh, from a uh, individualistic, you know, personal centric outlook. Yeah, that's not what that saying means at all. That is a layman's interpretation. It really doesn't matter what other people think of it. It is more important how the individual adept interprets it. People like Trent Reznor, a lot of those guys have been influenced by Crowley as well. Yeah. Are. A lot of I, these underground groups and stuff all love Crowley, or they actually were inspired by the ideas of chaos, magic, and Crowley to make music. So that was like being a magician was the predicate. I doubt it was a predicate. It may be in addition to it. I'm not trying to say no musician and no artist study the occult. I am sure some of them do. What I'm trying to say is it is an additional study that may influence their art as with any other form of inspiration. It does not mean that there is some secret cabal to, uh, what was this video about again? Oh yeah, the September 11th hijackings. We went so far off the rabbit trail I had forgotten. Anybody it, listening to this, I would encourage you don't go out looking for it and playing it. Yes, by all means, don't find out the truth for yourself. Don't do any research. Let these three guys tell you how to interpret all these things. Uh, that, you know, we're talking about some dangerous stuff that can open some doors. I well, don't not only that, but his poetry is just, it's disgusting. I mean, I've tried to read some of his poetry and it's, pardon me, if you got kids in the room, cover their ears, but it's, it's all about this, this pan figure, this, this image of Azazel taking him from behind and stuff. I mean, it's just this bizarre, homosexual, pornographic, bestial type of sexual magic that is just perverse in every sense of the word. I am not familiar with the poem by Aleister Crowley regarding Azaziel. I could not find it either in my library or online. The poem to Pan is rather famous and well known. Indeed, it can be read with homosexual erotic undertones. Crowley was a known bisexual with a healthy libido. He was not an apologist. He did not create art or write poems or rituals to offend anyone. If someone is offended by his creation, that's their problem. Their offense, not his. As it reads in Matthew 5.29, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. I think there's one where he ta he puts himself in and somebody in the uh, having sex with Pan. It's him and Pan having sex in the air. Doesn't sound too unusual for Crowley's poems, but I'm still not sure which one you're referring to, or if it is even a poem by Crowley. Maybe in the future you'll provide links, cite your sources, and have correct quotes. This is one of them. And then if you really want to get into some of his more awful stuff, there's, well, I won't, I won't even name it, but there's one about him and his girlfriend basically engaged in the most vile depravity you can imagine. And there was actually another one that came up recently that, um, I mean, I don't even want to share, but basically Crowley's a pedophile. Yeah, okay, Free Willy. You're going to have to back that up with some evidence. If you are referring to a diary entry from the Magical Record of the Beast 666, the diaries of Alistair Crowley, his writings do not constitute action. One can write about murder and not commit it. One can write about traveling to stars in a spaceship and not actually do it. One can write about sexual encounters and not have been involved in them. Many poems are pure fiction. He was never convicted or ever accused of being a pedophile. You want to throw accusations? Fine. You want to prove them? You're going to have to give some concrete evidence. It's easy to defame someone after they are dead. So, yeah. Well, he's, it, he's also a corpophagiac, right? Meaning that in some of his rituals, he ended up getting to the point where they were actually eating each other's fecal material. 
This is not a ritual. I believe you're referring to another one of Alistair Crowley's fictional poems. Again, you simply make the accusation and offer no evidence. Crowley was into many sexual acts that at the time were deemed unusual maybe even taboo, even by today's standards. All of his sexual partners were consenting adults. As such, they could do whatever they want behind closed doors as long as they agreed to it and it is legal. Right. So I, I included that. I mean, that's just, I mean, people need to understand that this level of, this, this is this is not same conduct to me. It seems like Aleister Crowley, as he got older, his his magical practices got more insane and it's, not all sexual acts are for everyone. Judging that someone else's pleasure is not your pleasure doesn't mean it's insane. Just not for you and something you would not enjoy. It was, you know, what I think one of the most interesting aspects of Aleister Crowley's practice with sexual magic is the number of women that wound up in insane asylums. Right. Yeah. How many women? I mean, I mean, t tell me, you probably know more about that than I do. Well, his first wife was uh, Kelly. She ended up a a hopeless drunk who ended up in a sanatorium. Sanitarium. Alistair Crowley married Rose Edith Kelly on August 11, 1903. They had two children together. She was instrumental in helping him write the Book of the Law. They divorced in 1909. In 1911, Crowley had her committed to an asylum for alcohol dementia. Kelly died in 1932. She died at the age of 58. And then there was another of his wives who was... We met in the 30s. She ended up at a mental institution. Crowley's second wife, Maria Teresa Sanchez. Crowley married Sanchez in August of 1929 until his death in December of 1947. He had many scarlet women and male lovers, but only his first wife, Rose, was committed to an asylum for alcohol dementia. And dementia is a form of dementia caused by long-term excessive consumption of alcoholic beverages, resulting in neurological damage and impaired cognitive function. Crowley actually bragged to somebody, this guy by the name of Lance Steve King. I actually talked to his son. His son reached out to me when I knew, when I when he realized I mentioned his dad, but he had spent time with Crowley in the south of France, and Crowley had told him, uh, people, what did he say? He said something about people only end up with me dead in the insane asylum or giving me all their money. Well, whatever it was that this person supposedly heard doesn't reflect reality, which is really not surprising. He made, I can't remember the quote verbatim, but it's really true. One, there was one of his followers, a guy by the name of Mud, who had the misfortune of uh, getting tied up with Crowley, who filled his pants full of rocks and walked out in water and drowned himself. Norman Mudd was found dead of an apparent suicide. Crowley was not responsible for it. And then there was... The guy who died at the magical fraternity um, at the Abbey of Philema, his name was uh, Raul Loveday. Oh, you know, funny name. It was like a Spanish name. Anyway, it's you right now. But yeah, so people around Crowley, his, his Leo Sublime, which he, he wrote that nasty poetry about his girlfriend, she ended up, he abandoned her and went off with another woman following his true will. And she became a prostitute on the streets of Paris. Leah Hersig. She spent some time homeless and on the streets of Paris. Back when 9-11 happened, and I was drinking the Kool-Aid like most of the normal people. By drinking Kool-Aid, do you mean basing their opinion on the overwhelming evidence and facts readily available? Um, when I started entertaining the idea that 9-11, there was more to the story than what we were being told by the mainstream media. I really think it was when you came out and you tied what happened on that day to the numerical system in, in Crowley's magical practices that I saw a mathematical pattern. And to me, mathematical patterns in, in, in indicate intelligence, you know, some sort of forethought. Everything can be described and understood by mathematics. Measuring the circumference of the earth, the growth of fractals, the petals and flowers, simply finding numbers and things we have already associated numbers with is not mathematics, it's association. You are associating numbers with other numbers based off several different methods. No one method if followed, nor are any of the numbers actually valid. When needed, you simply fudge the numbers to meet your goal. And so it was really that mathematical fingerprint on 9-11 that really swayed me into realizing this was a ritual of some sort. A ritual of some sort? What ritual involves buildings, hijackers, and airplanes? I would be fascinated to know because I've never come across it. Maybe it is in Lieber 9-11. And that was before I even really learned about the symbolism of the towers and what was involved with, you know, the, the, you know, the occultic symbolism. What occult symbolism? 
You mean the nonsense you are reading into it? At the base of the towers and the way it ties in, you know, the pillars and blah, 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 blah. Every, everybody knows all about that. Blah, blah, blah. Everybody knows about that. No, no. Not everybody knows about your forced random association of nonsensical bullcrap. But the, you put, you made those dots. You, you connected those dots for me. Do you mind talking about Crowley's math and 9-11 a little bit? Oh, this should be incredibly entertaining. Well, Crowley said that you could you could define the uni uh, the universe by mathematics. That was Pythagoras, uh, but whatever. So when he laid out his magical system, he tied a lot of his ideas to numbers. So, and one of his most important number was the number eleven, the number of magic. Gematria based on either Latin, Greek, or Hebrew letters to numbers and numerology is not the end all of magical thought and learning. It is a component, simply an element thereof. Why is 11 the number of magic? Well, in numerology, it has like a nefarious idea, but it also is the unity of the macrocosm with the microcosm, the pentagram and the uh, hexagram. So basically, you have a 5 and a 6. That equals 11. The reason why is because the magician. It's supposed to be at the center of the universe, taking the macrocosm and the microcosm and putting them together themselves. That's why Harry Potter's name is a five and a six. That's why his the wand of Harry Potter is eleven inches long. So uh, J.K. Rowling had it was pretty on point about that stuff. But so since eleven. Just, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Since you just mentioned J.K. Rowling, do you think it's true that she changed the middle initial to K because it was the eleventh letter of the alphabet? Holy fucking hell! Who cares? It's like listening to paranoid meth heads tying random shit together, except these guys ain't high. At least I don't think they're high. I do, because it's not her real name. It's not her okay. name. Um, I think she dodges that, she dodges that uh, question when people ask her that, um, because it doesn't represent a name. It's not like K for Carolina or something. It's just K. Um, but also, I I think that she had a very, she is well educated. She has a degree in classics, but I think that it, there's a there's a decent chance that her whole story about drafting Harry Potter is fiction, and that it was a team, you know, a group of people came together to come up with this idea. I don't have time to dismantle every single one of these absurd assumptions. Just move on. But that's a whole different story. Um, and it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be the first time that you know bands have had people in the background or books uh, with ghost writers, but. Uh, all right, my friends, thank you so much. This is the end of this video. If you'd like to support my work, please consider supporting me on either PayPal or through Patreon. Please share this on your social media. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Lesson B.